Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37, we're in the middle of a series called Anticipating God in 2020. The goal of the series is to do a bit of a survey of some passages of Scripture that are designed to provoke the faith of God's people, to stir up our faith at the greatness, the grandeur, the promises of our God. That's the goal of this series. That as we anticipate his work in our lives in the coming year, really in the coming lifetime, that we would have this kind of view of God, that, that God would be to us all that he is in the scriptures and nothing less. That's our goal this morning, Ezekiel chapter 37. In, in preparation for this message, I was reading a bit about the forced deportation of Polish citizens during the early years of World War II. In some cases, citizens of Poland were uprooted from their homes by the communist government of Russia and taken nearly 3,000 miles away to Siberia. Try to imagine for a moment, if you can, just, just put yourself in the mind of a husband, a wife, father, mother, a child in those early 1940s. Try to imagine the trauma of being taken from your home and forcibly moved 3,000 miles away. Your familiar surroundings are gone. Your independence is gone. This is not a voluntary exile. They were required to do this. Your, surely some of your acquaintances are no longer with you. And in addition, there is the certainty that your homeland is under the control of a foreign power. There is nothing really of home to look back to because even your home, and even over the coming years, would be devastated by invasion and conquest. So you are in exile, your home is conquered, your very identity would begin to be jeopardized. Imagine the trauma of that moment. And if we can, that puts us into the situation of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 37. In this moment, Israel has been conquered. They have been exiled. They have been removed from their land. Their former independence has been decimated. Their hopes dashed. Their familiarity ruined. And they have no reasonable hope of this being reversed. There is no power on earth at that time, in the Mediterranean world at least, greater than the Babylonian Empire. And certainly they have no confidence that they will be rescued even by their God because the reason for their exile is their own rejection of God. So for the Israelites, in some ways, it's even worse than it was for these Polish exiles because this was an exile of their own making. They had rejected God, and God had ultimately rejected them. They had turned away from Him, and He had thrust them out of their promised land. And there they are, far from home, and in many ways their home is no more, far from hope, helpless and desolate. And into that moment, God speaks through his prophet. Let's begin reading Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, they were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. 
And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied. As I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you. And you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. Lord God, speak again through your word. This passage breaks quite simply, I'm sure you can tell this as well, down into two sections. There's a, a vision of new life, and then there's the promise of new life. There's a, a vision of new life, and then there's a promise of new life. The opening verse declares that the hand of the Lord is placed upon the prophet Ezekiel, and he is brought in the Spirit into the middle of the valley of dry bones. Now, it's, it's possible this actually physically took place. We certainly believe God was able to do that, but it seems likely that this is a, a vision, a spiritual vision that's intending to depict reality. He is brought in the Spirit of God and set in the middle of a valley, and it is full, it says, of bones. And these bones are meant to be inspected closely. So you notice that God leads Ezekiel around and to and fro among the bones. He wants there to be no doubt about the breadth and scope and the true nature of the death of this valley. This was the original death valley. This is Death Valley beyond all comprehension. This is Death Valley, the scope of which Ezekiel has never seen. This apparently was an army that had been slaughtered, and there were no survivors such that they could not even be buried properly. It is as though everything has been decimated, and apparently this devastation is in the distant past. Their life is ages ago. Their moments of might are in the distant past because these bones are very dry. There aren't even corpses in the valley. There are just skeletons, skeletal remains, not even given the honor of a proper burial. And if we remember the laws of cleanliness and uncleanliness designed to talk about uh, godliness and holiness in the Old Testament, this, this is a very unclean kind of valley. Death, uncleanness, desolation, hopelessness, might only in the distant past, absolutely no life for the future. That's what this valley is intending to communicate. And God asks Ezekiel, a provoking question. Son of man, he says, can these bones live? Ezekiel answers 
cautiously. Oh, Lord God, you know. It's likely, given who Ezekiel was, that he wasn't raising a question about God's ability to raise these bones from the dead. It's likely instead that he's, he's offering to God his uncertainty about God's willingness to do so. It's probably not far from Ezekiel's mind that these bones are indeed an accurate depiction, though God hasn't said that to him yet, that these are a very accurate depiction of God's people under God's judgment for their sin. And since God's judgment had been promised and predicted and covenanted toward them if they rejected him, Ezekiel is likely cautious. Surely God can raise bones into an army, but does he want to? Ezekiel is aware that hundreds of years have passed since the kingship of David, since there was a king after God's own heart, and in that time the kings of Israel and Judah have rejected God, they've worshipped idols, and the people have followed in their poor leadership after generation and generation of this kind of rebellion wickedness. Ezekiel is right to wonder, do you want to make them live? Can they live? Only you know, Lord. Ezekiel, for the first 36 chapters, has spent a remarkable amount of time judging God's people for having rejected him and declaring that even the nations are full of rebellion against the Creator God. And here he comes to the Valley of Dry Bones, the evidence of the rejection of God. And he says to God, only you know, Lord, only you know whether you would want these bones to live. And then we find the instructions to Ezekiel in verse 4. The Lord says to him, prophesy over these bones. Old Testament prophesy, prophesying was simply a, a way of, of declaring the word of the Lord. It was being the mouthpiece of God. And so God declares to Ezekiel, you will speak for me over these bones and you will say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to the bones, you will live. You will live. So Ezekiel is to <laughs> preach to a graveyard, and in preaching to that graveyard, God promises that life will come out of death. He is to preach to a valley full of uncleanness and devastation and absolute hopelessness for generations, and God declares resurrection will be the result. There will be flesh that will enter these bones, and then breath will come upon them. And as Ezekiel prophesies, indeed, that is what happens in verse 7. He prophesies as he was commanded, and there was a sound, a rattling. We can only imagine a valley full of bones coming together. What the sound would be like. Hundreds, maybe thousands of skeletons finding their rightful places, joints coming together. And here is this mighty army now, and yet they are still dead. The flesh has come upon them. There is now muscles and faces and, and hair, and, and there is now where there was just a, a, a skeletal remains. There is bodies, and yet, and yet they, they still are merely corpses. And so he is commanded again, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy to the breath, Ezekiel, and say, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds and come into this army. One commentator I read said that likely he references the four winds to remind Ezekiel and anyone reading that he is the God of heaven and earth. He's not merely a tribal deity. He can command the four winds of creation to come and resurrect his people. All things are under his command. And there is nothing dead that cannot be made alive again by the God who created life in the first place. Come from the four winds, he says, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, he says, as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. We can only imagine winds coming from every direction and rushing through this corpse army and suddenly eyes open, movement begins. There is life. There was merely a graveyard of skeletons and now, now they stand on their feet, an exceedingly great army. 
Ezekiel has been treated to a, a vision of impossible miracle, a, a, a vision of impossible transformation, impossible resurrection. The hopelessness of a skeleton valley is now a great army. Those who had only strength in the past and had been dead a very long time and were, were dry and scattered are now raised up and strong and mighty. And Ezekiel has witnessed it through the word of the Lord. And lest Ezekiel or any reader miss the point, God transitions from the vision to a promise that is explicit. He doesn't want Ezekiel to miss it because it's possible to believe that God can hypothetically raise the dead, but doubt that he intends to do it in your case. It is possible to philosophically believe in a God who can do supernatural things, is it not? Is it not possible to believe? Well, I'm, I'm sure, there, I mean, hypothetically, there could be a God so great that he could raise a graveyard into a mighty army. Sure, I can, I can mentally assent to that, but not necessarily believe that for you, that is God's actual intention. Somewhere over there in the world, I'm sure God raises the dead, but I'm not sure that happens in my case or in my world. And so God makes this transition in verse 11. He says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. And they are not wrong. God had told his people that were they to turn away from him, they would be cut off. Very theological idea bound up even with, with their basic mark of citizenship in Israel. That were they to reject God, they would be cut off. They would be discarded. They would be removed from his presence. Like Adam and Eve, they would be thrust out and that is indeed what has happened. They are not wrong. Our, our hope is lost. Yes, it is. Our bones even are dried up. Our, our strength is all in the past. There is no future for us. We are, we are lost. We are not found. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Ezekiel, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves. He changes the metaphor slightly. He pictures the people of Israel buried and in tombs. And he pictures himself speaking to those tombs and declaring, Come forth. I will open your graves and I will raise you from your graves. The people of Israel have been buried. They are not sick. They are not weak. They are not struggling or declining. They are buried. They are under the earth. They are lost to death. They are cut off. And yet, out of their graves will come the people of God, commanded by the resurrecting power of God's word. I will bring you into the land of Israel. And Here's this phrase that's been repeated again and again. You shall know that I am the Lord. The Lord has decided for the sake of his own reputation to raise up a dead people and make them live. He has decided so that those people can know that he is who he says he is. So that their, their resurrection will have the effect of accurately revealing the nature and character of their God. How will we know who the Lord is? Because he is the one who raised us from the grave. How will we know who our God is? Because he is the one who caused bones to become a great army. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves. And listen to this precious, loving, gracious description. Oh, my people. Oh, my people. Every my in God's word should be precious to us. Oh, my people. Here are these idolatrous, rebellious, wicked people. For generations they have rejected God and bowed down to idols of stone and declared they were more trustworthy than Yahweh. And God still calls them my. 
They are dead. They are lost. They are in the grave. And God looks at the grave and he says, Mine! That corpse is mine. And that skeleton is mine. That one is mine. You know who my people are, God says? A lot of dead corpses and graves. Mine. Of all the people God could have, of all the beings God could have, he claims corpses who are dead because of their rejection of him. He claims corpses as mine. And I will put my spirit within you, he says, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. The king of heaven declares the impossible. Contrary to the military dominance of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian empire, the king of heaven declares the people of Israel will go back to their land. There is no might on earth that will keep me not only from resurrecting you, but from placing you in the land of promise where I will dwell with you. I will be your God and you will be my people. Then, here it is again, you shall know that I am the Lord. We, we want to notice the repetition of, of the Bible. The, the, the biblical writers, they don't use italics or bold or blue goofy font or something. They, they use repetition. And so when Ezekiel is told again and again, the reason for this is so that you will know that I am the Lord. It is God's intention that the universe know who he is. That was why when he created Adam and Eve, he made them in his image so that the universe would know who he was in miniature. And in this case, it's why he raises up the dead corpses of his people and brings them back into their land contrary to all of their rights or, or deservings, contrary to all physical possibilities, so that how? So that they can know that he is the Lord. The knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I am the Lord, he says. I have spoken and I will do it. The word of God is unvoidable. It is unstoppable. It is irresistible. It will accomplish this impossible resurrection, this revival from death to life, from exile to permanent home. It will bring this about so that the people of God can declare, He is the Lord and there is no other. He is the Lord and there is none like Him. God promises to give new life to his desolate people. God promises to give new life to his desolate people, to reveal that he is the Lord by saving those who rejected him, to reveal his mercy and his power, to reveal his resurrecting promises in their life, that though they are far away and distant and deservedly so, there is a gracious God in heaven who sees corpses and still claims them as his own and will lift them out of their graves and plant them in the land he intends to give to them. Now this promise comes to people sitting in Babylon when it feels impossible, when it seems unthinkable. It is a, a promise that requires faith. And yet looking backward, we can see at least two significant, one lesser and one greater fulfillments of this promise, that God did do what he said. Because in just a few decades, beyond any expectation of the moment, there is a declaration from a new king that the people of God will indeed be allowed to return to their land under Ezra and under Nehemiah. Contrary to all of their expectations, somehow they get to go back. They get to rebuild their temple. They get to rebuild the city. And this promise is quite physically fulfilled. And yet the promise still seems in ways incomplete or 
less robust than what they would long for. We, we read in those, those narratives of how the people who had seen the old temple weep when they see the new temple because it doesn't seem as glorious as they were hoping for. It didn't seem as though the glory of the Lord entered it as Ezekiel will prophesy is to happen. And yet he does indeed bring them back into their land. And so when we come to the New Testament scriptures, there is still this sense of longing. You want to read the Old Testament with a sense of partial fulfillment. Because again and again, that's what we see. There is a, there is a partial fulfillment, but still this sense of incompleteness, this sense of longing. Have you completely done this yet, Lord? Is the Spirit truly in the people of God? Are, 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 they, are they truly fully removed from exile? And that leads us to the coming of Jesus Christ. Did you notice Ezekiel calls himself the Son of Man, a, a same term that Jesus applied to himself. John calls Jesus the Word of God. It is, it is God's new speaking in the person of His Son. And in this speaking, there is life. In the speaking that is Jesus Christ, there is life. Seen in John chapter 11 when Jesus stands near a tomb of His friend and a relative is perplexed about the death of this friend, and Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Let's consider this passage in terms of what we've seen in Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. He is the ultimate and great prophet of God. He is God's voice commanding the dead of all nations to rise and come from their graves and come from their lostness and return home to God. And so when he stands outside of that tomb, yes, he was saving his friend, but he was also giving a metaphor for the ultimate reality of heaven and earth, past and future. When he declared, Lazarus, come forth, he was demonstrating that he is indeed the God who speaks and life begins. The God who said, let there be and there was, comes into creation and declares, let there be and there was. He speaks, and Lazarus, the dead man, comes forth. And he speaks, and crowd after crowd, and nation after nation of spiritually dead come forth. That's why we have this, this kind of language in the New Testament that you were dead in your transgressions and sins, and yet God made you alive together with Christ. God lifted you out of your grave. God spoke to corpses, and they became an exceedingly great army. And so in this passage where we see people exiled far from God with their hope lost, cut off, we should see ourselves. We should see ourselves in that valley of dry bones, nothing but a spiritual skeleton, a corpse in a grave. And there in our helplessness and hopelessness, God speaks through his son, the word, and that son of man rises us from our graves. And we become an exceedingly great army who were before nothing but death and desolation. God promises to give new life to his desolate people, and he ultimately gives new life to the person of his son. I made all things Jesus said. He says to each Christian, I make you new. You were dead, but you shall live. You were in the grave, but you shall be raised. You were nothing but a corpse, a skeleton on a spiritual hillside, but you shall be lifted up. And the way in which the word of God does this is remarkable, is it not? His ultimate revelation 
was that our life would be brought about by his death. As he takes on our flesh so that he can die, he raises us to life so that we can live. God, the Word, the Spirit who cannot be killed, takes on flesh that can be slaughtered and taken into a grave so that his people can be brought out of the grave. It is, it is as though Jesus didn't just speak to our grave, but he went into it and carried us out. He saved Lazarus from outside the tomb. He saved us from inside it. He goes into our death, into our exile. And there in our exile, he brings us home. There in our exile, he gathers the, the captive to death, those who are under death's sway, those who has, have no hope, whose hope is cut off. And he reunites them to the God who is their life. And then he pours out his spirit on his people. That's why he says, I will send you the spirit. And indeed he does. The risen Christ sends the breath of God into the people of God. And they live an exceedingly great army. Do you see how this is in some ways, just a, a small vision of what will ultimately be a global movement, a global act by the ultimate Son of Man. The ultimate Son of Man who will speak to the far reaches of creation through His people, and His Spirit will raise the dead from their graves. They will rise up, and though they were lost, they will be found. Though they were cut off, they will be restored. Though they were exiled, they will be brought home. Consider the word of God, Jesus Christ, who speaks and life is recreated. How do we apply this to ourselves? How do we believe in the word who is Christ, bringing new life through the spirit of Christ so that there is a people of Christ? How do we do that? How do we exercise that belief? How do we respond to this passage? Let me give you three categories of people. The lifeless, the lamenting, and the longing. First, let me speak about the lifeless. This passage, and there are others like it, is part of a theme throughout Scripture that declares that there is a death apart from God. There is physical death. There is also spiritual death. And this graphically illustrates that as a valley of bones or people in a grave. And we as Christians need to hold on to not just the abstract idea of resurrection, but the actual belief that Jesus Christ raises people from the dead. This is what it means to be a Christian. You cannot be a Christian and deny or doubt the reality of the resurrection power of God. And yet, functionally, we hold on to that as a philosophy, but don't function in it as a reality. Let me give you an example. All around us, there are lifeless people that we doubt God can save. And yet, this valley of dry bones that turns into an army is meant to inspire and provoke us that there is no bone-dry person that God can't turn into a living, breathing, passionate Christian for the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what happened with every Christian who's sitting here. There is no person sitting here who was half dead and was resuscitated. Every person sitting here is a resurrection story. Listen, I, I was dead. I, I wasn't just a nice, half-dead, moralistic church kid. I was dead. I was lost. And my ongoing sins are enough to remind me of how lost I would be without the grace of God. Listen, if I sin as much as I do, having grown up in the church and having come to know Jesus, what would I be like if God hasn't raised me from the dead? What would you be like? 
you ever pondered how death-like you would be if there weren't the grace of God present in your life? Listen, Christian, you were a corpse and God raised you from the dead spiritually. You were cut off and God saved you. He reattached you. He reformed you. He revived you. Sitting here, there is all the testimony we need that there is no skeleton, spiritually speaking, beyond the reach of God's resurrecting power. There are hundreds of people right now in this building who were corpses and are now alive. Listen, maybe you're sitting here right now and you're still in a lifeless state. There's a decent sized room here. There might be people right now that actually, when God looks at you, you know what he sees? A spiritually lifeless individual. A, a person who is living and breathing, walking physically, but has no life of God in their heart. And I have to be faithful to this passage, so let me just preach to you, following in the footsteps of Ezekiel and humbly representing the Lord Jesus Christ, come out of your grave and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every person has a moment where they walk out of the grave. It was an otherwise ordinary moment. It was an otherwise normal day. The sun rose in the morning every day that a person got saved. They got up and they encountered Jesus and where they were once dead, they were then alive. This could be your day. There are some people here, surely, surely, some people here who are currently lifeless. Let me tell you, there is a Savior who can raise the dead. And there is a Savior who can raise you. There is a Savior who is not impressed or frightened by your current <laughs> inboundness to your sin, by your current lifelessness. He can speak and you can suddenly love him. He can speak and you can suddenly know him. He can speak and you can suddenly be convicted of the sins that to this point you've loved. He can speak and make you want to know him as the Lord. In fact, by his word, he is speaking right now. So let me, by the grace of God, humbly declare, if there are lifeless people here, let me declare to you, live. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and believe on the one who can raise the dead. Turn away from the banquet in the grave that you've been eating and nibbling at all of your days and come to the one who is the resurrection and the life. Stop being a skeleton and start being a soldier for the Lord Jesus. And brothers and sisters, I say this to all of us, myself included, the pastors, there is no lifeless person Jesus can't save. I'm talking about your cousin and your in-laws and your parents and your neighbors. I'm, I'm talking about the, the person who laughs at you when you talk about church. I'm talking about that person. God sees them as a skeleton that it takes a moment to raise them to life. I was just talking to a relative this week that when I was a child, we prayed for her to get saved. And it seemed entirely unlikely because they were very well off and doing fine. And yet now she was just texting me how grateful she is for how the Lord is revealing himself to her in the midst of a trial. Listen, at one point that seemed highly unlikely and now it seems inevitable. And that's true of every lifeless person. Listen, your neighbor, your brother, your son, your sister, your father, your in-law, your aunt, your cousin, your co-worker. Look, the next person you might meet this week when you're grabbing a coffee, they might be a skeleton now. But some of them, God means to raise to life. Second category, the lamenting. You can only imagine that when the Lord quotes the people of Israel saying, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost, we indeed are cut off, that at least some of them, that wasn't just hopelessness, that was sadness and sorrow. If you read the book of Lamentations, you get a flavor for what it, it feels like when a person is aware their sins have distanced them from God. Look, some of you here are saved. You have life in you. But you wonder whether God can still work in you because of your sins. 
you're, you're not in exile, but you're, you're wondering whether you function in a, a quasi-exile from the closeness and the presence of God. You wonder whether you're on some kind of plan B with God, non-exiled, but non-army member. Listen, this passage should encourage you. If God loved you when you were a corpse, he certainly loves you when you're asleep. If God loved you when you were bones cut off and defiled, he certainly can revive you when you are sluggish. I guarantee if you ask any doctor, they will tell you, it is easier to wake someone up than raise them from the dead. That's medical guarantee. And let me tell you, the God who can raise the dead can wake someone from sleep. Are you lamenting some area of sin in your life right now? Do you see some sluggishness of soul, some apathy, some slowness of heart, some worldliness, some distraction from God, some lingering rebellion, and you wonder whether you've cut yourself off from the reviving power of God. Listen, the God who can resurrect you can certainly revive you. If you believe in resurrection, you must, by definition, believe in revival. And you must believe that there is no place that God's people can be where they are beyond the reach of His reviving power. That's, that's one of the reasons we come to church. Church is a mini revival every Sunday. I'm not talking about a tent and emotionalism. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about that the Word of God is reviving hearts in profound ways and unnoticeable ways. Every time the Word is preached and humble hearts receive it, there is revival going on and you are not beyond the reach of God's reviving power. Look, if you feel dry, if you feel cut off, you're not saying I'm not a Christian, but I functionally feel distant from the Lord. Let me tell you, if you are lamenting the sluggishness and apathy of your heart, you follow a God who raises the dead and there is no spiritual apathy beyond His power. I don't care how corpse-like you feel right now. One day you were a corpse, and then you started worshiping Jesus. And whatever you feel like right now, God can restore the worship of His name to your heart. God can bring the fruit of His Spirit in your life. God can blow His Spirit on you afresh and turn you again into a mighty soldier shouting His praise. This passage leaves no room for lamenting that God has cut me off. Repent of your sins, but don't stay there doubting that God can restore you. Don't confuse repentance with doubt. Repentance acknowledges where I have turned from God. Doubt disbelieves that God is still turned towards me. Doubt feels godly, but God has taken atonement and regeneration entirely into his own hands, and he will not share it with you. Doubt feels godly, but it's actually godless. The repenting Christian has every reason to believe that God has promised to revive their heart. Final category, the longing. The longing. Maybe you, in some ways, identify with those two other categories, lifeless longing, but maybe, or lamenting, but maybe, maybe you just long. Maybe you just long to see the Spirit of God active and present in His people, that they would feel like an army, that they would not feel cut off, that they would not feel distant, that they would feel like they are at home in the presence of God. Maybe you, you identify with that sense of, of longing, longing to be home, longing to be seeing God do mighty works among His people. Let me, let me encourage you. God's people are meant to long and call out for the mighty work of God among them. 
They are meant to long for it. You, if you are a Christian, you are meant to long for the mighty acts of God to be seen in private and in public. When we scatter and when we gather, you are meant to long for it. This passage over the centuries surely was designed to inspire God's people to see his mighty acts. In the light of the fact that Jesus Christ came Surely no longing that took place from 580 B.C. to that cry in Bethlehem was overestimated. Surely they didn't long more than God intended to fulfill. And now that we have seen the mighty power of the Lord Jesus and his disposition to do good to his people, surely, surely there is no longing cry for God's spirit to blow over his people, those dead or those sluggish, that is too great for the Lord Jesus to answer. It was the Lord Jesus who said, if you ask... The Holy Spirit will be given. The breath of God will blow on his people. And when they gather, you will encounter the mighty presence of God among you. So if you are longing, let me just give you a very, very simple application. In light of the fact that God promises to give new life and to revive the life of his desolate people, let me encourage you, turn your longing into prayer. Turn your longing into prayer. Pray specifically. Pray for the mighty presence of God when we gather. Pray for it when we scatter. When we scatter. Pray for it when we are alone. Pray for it when we are together. Pray for it when we're in small group. Pray for it when we're here on Sunday. Pray that we will have words of encouragement that are mighty in power and anointing. Pray for the preached word. Pray that everyone who preaches from this palm will be anointed with power from on high. Pray for children to be saved. Pray for the dead to be raised to life. Pray for healing. Pray for the mighty power of God. Anticipate him through prayer. Listen, if you would say, I, I don't think I'm lifeless. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm obviously a sinner, but I don't, I'm not aware of just running towards sin right now. Listen, you might be in this category of longing. And this passage encourages you to long with faith and to pray and anticipate with faith, to lean forward with faith. Listen, if you are distracted from the greatness of God by work and busyness and other legitimate activities, clear away the distractions until you start longing again. Let nothing get in the way of longing for God to reveal this promise in your life and around you to revive his desolate people. If this is not the first thing that you are looking forward to, then something else is in the way that needs to be cleared out of the way. The Son of Man, the Word of God, has spoken into creation has sent his spirit, has revealed his power. And God has promised in him to revive desolate, lifeless people and certainly to revive his wandering and apathetic people. God has spoken in his son and that son has poured out on us the gift of his Holy Spirit. And there is nothing that we have to do but long and pray and respond to what he has promised to do. Brothers and sisters, we must know that he is the Lord. This is the purpose you live, to know that he is the Lord. It is the highest purpose of your existence, and God reveals that he is the Lord by reviving dead and lifeless hearts. So know him. Believe in the reviving power of our God. Let's pray. We invite Juan to come forward as well. Lord Jesus, thank you for reviving our hearts, for resurrecting us. And Lord, revive us anew. 
since we are alive, make us more energetic and passionate in you. Fill us with your spirit that has regenerated us. And Lord, for anyone here who doesn't know you, would this be their day of being brought from death to life? But we declare to you, you made us. You remade us. You rescued us. You brought us home. We were cut off, but now we are restored. We were lost, but now we are found. We were dead, but now we are alive. And we exalt you, the great Son of Man, the Word of God. You are the resurrection and the life. You are the way and the truth and the life. No one who comes to you will ever be put to shame. Receive our song now, Lord. Receive our declaration of what you have done. Let's stand and sing.